seminar today is how to spot fake news and trends and development in multimedia journalism. Now this is election season, so fake news is going to be a big topic. And also with the coronavirus, multimedia journalism is also going to be a prime topic. So I think this will be of interest to, to us uh, because uh, we are facing these issues on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, so please uh, join me in welcome Dendi, Dendi Weller. Thank you. Hello, uh, thank you so much for having me. Um, I'd, I'd like to start by thanking the UCA for hosting me for this trip. I had the most amazing time in Narin. The students I met there are so interested in their local communities, whatever country they come from, and they're doing a level of public interest journalism in their assignments, which is quite different from what we see in undergraduate students in Australia. Um, and it was in really inspiring as a journalism educator to spend time with them during that week. So it's also a really beautiful location. So if you get a chance to go, I really recommend that you go and play in the snow. Okay, let's just see what's happened with my... Okay, so uh, the first part of my presentation today is going to be... Um, I'm just gonna... Is that... Can you hear that okay? Yep, great. The first part of my presentation is was written by um, Google and uh, in combination with First Draft News and Bellingcat, which are the two peak organisations in the world at the moment who are doing verification of social media, video and photographs. Um, the, the presentation is brought to you by the Walkley Foundation in Australia. It's the peak body for journalists in Australia and um, the Walkley, I'm just going to move that so I'm not popping so hard. How's that? Bit better? Yeah. So the Walkley um, Foundation is the peak body for journalists. They are part of the journalism union in Australia as well, uh, but they're a separate foundation and they fund this um, project that Google is doing in Australia. Um, so our um, uh, experience is based on Google's global news initiative, which uh, launched two years ago. And our goal last year in Australia was to tra train 4,000 journalists in the verification techniques that you will learn today. Um, we exceeded our target last year and the program was so successful and so oversubscribed during the year that we decided to extend it for indefinitely. So we're doing it again in 2020. We have trained journalists at all the major news organisations in Australia. So organisations you might have heard of like the ABC, the Australian newspaper, the Sydney Morning Herald. Um, we've also gone into small newsrooms in regional towns and trained journalists who are working on the ground in those locations. Um, the Google News Initiative came up, came about because of um, Google's in recognition in 2018 that something was going vastly wrong with the way journalism was being done on the internet. And uh, so they formed a multi-million dollar project to go around the world and give this education to journalists in order to combat fake news. They're doing other stuff to combat fake news as well. They have changed the way Google search works and changed the way different results are given in search and changed the way you're fed information so that um, fake news is less likely to rise to the top. But it is always the case that the responsibility to identify fake news is with the end user. So if we could have a really high degree of digital news literacy amongst our audiences, then the journalists would be able to spend less of their time um, or less of their energy worrying about verification and more of their energy on news gathering. So we also hope that the end audience will end up um, being better trained in these verification techniques. So anything you learn today that's fun, and some of it is really fun, um, I, I hope that you'll go and tell people about it over dinner and share it with your friends and family and um, spread the good word. Okay, so before we get started, I'd, if you've brought your laptop and you don't already have a Google account, please g Google um, create your Google account and join yourself up. So I'm going to start while you do that just by explaining to you some of the um, 
uh, tools that I use in Chrome that really help my um, verification work. Um, so in the corner, let me get my mouse up here, you'll see the extensions that I've added to Chrome up here. This one here is an ad blocker. We won't be discussing that today. Um, okay, so this here is a video download assistant. So when you're doing verification of video work on YouTube, it's very helpful to be able to download the video, enlarge it, maybe to bring it into an editing program like Premiere Pro, where you can see the waveform of the audio that can give you some clues sometimes. Um, and so this is one of the tools that you can use. It's an extension to Chrome. So if you just Google video download helper when you have Google Chrome open as your web browser, it will take you straight to the page and it's one click to download it. Um, the next one I have is frame by frame. So this one here is called frame by frame. It's a YouTube extension that works in Chrome as well. So again, if you Google frame by frame for YouTube, you'll find that extension and be able to add it to your Chrome. What that allows you to do is to go through a video one frame at a time. So if we get time later this afternoon, I'll show you a practical example of that. When you're looking at YouTube videos that aren't downloadable, this is an excellent tool that will allow you to be able to view it slowly so you can have a close look at any potential um, problems with the video. This is a reverse image search called Revi. There are a couple of great reverse image search engines. Um, I use Google reverse image search most often. I have heard down the grapevine that Revi works better in Russia. Um, I'm, I don't have any experience with that, but that's just a rumor that I've heard going around. It's always good to have a couple. One of the problems with these free tools that we use a lot in verification work is that they have a limited amount of uh, technical support behind them and they go offline quite often. So uh, two weeks ago, I did this presentation and the frame by frame viewer for YouTube wasn't, wasn't working. So um, it's, you know, which was awkward. Uh, so it's great to have a couple of options so that in that instance, you can go to a different option. And that's what I primarily have this reverse image search in my Chrome for. This is the Wayback Machine. So this is an internet archiving tool that's run by Google. Um, it is run by users around the world. So it's a, a, um, an archive that people voluntarily um, add internet pages to. What is great about this tool for journalists is if, when you've added it to Chrome, if you follow a link to a website that was previously live and the website has been taken down or the content of the site has been edited, um, the Wayback Machine will, will bring up a notification offering you the opportunity to load that an archived or cached version of that website. So when you have a politician who has tweeted something out, and then they've deleted the tweet and they deny that they ever tweeted it, this is a great um, tool. If you have a news site that has published a story and then they've subsequently re revised the story, this is an excellent tool for going back to the original publication. If you use this tool a lot, you can also become one of the contributors. So when you see a news story that you think is likely to be edited, you can cache the current version of it for future users. So it's a great community to be a part of and um, it works very well. I use this in my teaching weekly. So I, I teach multimedia journalism. It's often the case that the stories that I want to show students have been changed or taken offline since they were published. Um, the basic elements of the story will still be online. So if it's got video and audio, sometimes that won't be available. Um, but the, you know, the original story page will be in the Wayback Machine. So I can always go back and show students this material. Okay, um, this here is Session Buddy. So I'll just get a show of hands. Who gets tab shamed? Who has lots of tabs open in their internet browser? Yay, thank you, me too. Okay, you're, uh, you're gonna love the next two. Okay, so what Session Buddy does, and, and so for those of you who have tab shame, who hasn't, clo who hasn't turned off their computer in the last week? Yeah, I know. Yeah, I'm there too. Okay. Um, we all know that our computers run better when we turn them off a lot. 
if you edit video, which I do a lot of, you need to be doing that daily. Otherwise you'll end up with a machine that just won't run effectively with editing software. So what this thing does is it saves your whole internet session. So if you've got 45 tabs open and it's 505 and you really should have left work five minutes ago to go and meet your husband for dinner um, and you need to shut your computer down tonight because it was really a month since you last did that, you can save the whole session in one click and then tomorrow morning when you arrive at work, you can open all of those 45 tabs again. It will remember exactly where you were on each website. Um, so this is a fantastic tool which has made me much more efficient and it's made my tab shame problem much worse. The last one that I want to draw your attention to is this guy here, the great suspender. Um, what, yes, question? The session buddy, session. Um, this one, the great suspender, is another pun. Um, so what it does is if you've got lots of tabs open, it will put your tabs to sleep when you're not active in them. So again, if you're editing video or photographs or doing any process with your computer that uses a lot of um, memory, this is an excellent tool to keep your internet browser minimally demanding on your computer system. Um, I use this one all the time. So between this and Session Buddy, I can easily have 40 tabs open during a session. And I find that my computer runs just as well and my video editing is flawless. Access to reliable quality information should be a right of anybody, wherever they live. Today, the journalism industry faces many challenges. Readership has become more fragmented, and in many ways the experience of journalism has become more fragmented. How can news organizations remain relevant in the digital age? The traditional world of news media is shifting ever more quickly. 70% of people can't distinguish between a real story and fake news. Disinformation is on the rise. Trust in media is falling journalists are having to do more with less. A lot of the solutions will come from the journalism industry and the tech industry working together. So we're announcing the Google News Initiative, our effort to enable journalism to thrive in a digital age. It will enable new models for sustainable journalism, elevate quality journalism, and ensure that technology allows journalists to do their jobs even better. The solutions to the challenges that the industry is facing has to come from the right mix of journalism and technology. I'm really optimistic about the future of journalism. We just need to find the best ways for it to be able to flourish. I think there will always be a hunger for high quality journalism. I think it's never been more important for us to work together. And it's only through collaboration that we can do journalism in new and powerful ways. Because when journalism succeeds, we all do better. But the, uh, the basic premise that I just explained to you is still how search works. And I think it's important for every journalist to understand that the cross-referencing between websites has a massive impact on search rankings. If you don't get that, then you, you're not following why you've been served a certain set of results. So. Um, so you can see what it looked like in 1998. It's been developing pretty much between 2014 and 2017. Most news publishers around the world discovered that more of their audience was online than on desktop. So um, the functionality on a smartphone has become a big deal. The next step is um, audio searches. So in the United States right now, around 40% of Google searches are happening using audio devices like Alexa. And I'm really interested to see how that changes search because search results obviously can't be ranked in the same way with audio as they could be with video. When Google first started, you could SMS a query to Google and you would get an SMS answer back and that cost 10 cents per query. So I'm really glad they managed to scale it better than they did originally.
So one of the developments with search is that Google is now trying to serve a one click response to your queries as much as possible. So if you go to the Google search bar and type in weather Bishkek, you'll get this up in the first page of results. So the idea is that you don't have to see a list of results and then click to another page to get the information that you want. And they're increasingly doing this with as much stuff as they can. Most journalists I know have heard of advanced search, but can I just see a show of hands? Who uses advanced search on a daily basis? Great, awesome, cool. Normally that's zero people in the room. So um, the, the idea of advanced search is that it allows you to search with more precision. It's been really great for me as I've moved into an academic role to use advanced search and also to use Google Scholar. I don't cover that in my presentation today, but I do recommend that you have a look at Google Scholar if you are engaged in any kind of scholastic research or if you're a science reporter. So I started learning about Google Scholar when I started doing a lot of science writing in 2017. And I wrote about topics, uh, I, I wrote feature stories for a science publication about topics that I had no background in and I don't have a science degree. So I would get a commission to write a story about autism diagnosis in children over five. And with no background information on that, I would have to do the research and deliver the article within two weeks. Google Scholar helped me to identify who the key voices were in every different subject area that I looked into. Um, so it's, it's a great way of identifying who your interviewees are going to be. And it, I found it made my work much more efficient. So I recommend that you take a look at that. When you search the internet, we see what we call the surface web, which is also referred to as the indexed web. It's different from the dark web and the deep web, which are non-indexed websites. Um, it is estimated that the dark web, I've got it here, is about 10 times bigger than the, deep, than the surface web. So there is a lot more that you can see if you go below the waterline, but what we're gonna focus on today is as much as you can find at the waterline. Um, a lot of people may have used advanced search, um, but if you're not familiar with it, I will just give you a, a quick overview of a couple of terms that I will use. Um, one of the terms is operator. An operator is a special character that tells the search engine to do something a little different. So if I'm searching for a list of keywords, I can separate them by a comma and the comma is the operator. If I want to look for an exact word or phrase, I can put it in quotation marks. The quotation marks are the operator in that case. So if, if you hear me use that term, that's just what I mean. Um, okay, there are lots of operators. For example, if you, you can include and you can subtract stuff from your search. So you can use the minus sign to specify a particular item that you don't want in your results. For example, you can search Titanic cost to make minus film minus movie and you get the cost to make the boat. So the minus is one of my favorite operators to use. Um, you might get information at the box in the top of the search results. Um, you might see ads, but that information has been public, has been pulled from a definitive source. So as separate from ads, I'll show you an example of that in a moment. You can combine keyword searches like searching Brexit with a particular URL to find results from any particular site. You can also do the same thing with what's called a top level domain or TLD, like .gov or .edu. Um, so I'll give you an example of a search that was done in, um, by a journalist in Hong Kong using these operators. She had made repeated freedom of information requests to the Hong Kong government um, while she was pursuing a story about corruption in the building industry there. All of the freedom for, of information requests had been denied. So she started searching for PDF documents. That's a file type, which is another operator that you can use in the Hong Kong government's top level domain. And then she used keywords to narrow it down to building construction issues. And what she found a lot of were minutes from meetings. So the minutes from the meetings didn't necessarily have any um, uh, you know, scandalous information 
in them, but they did give her an overview of who was there and how long a particular issue was discussed for during each meeting and who talked about it. So then when she was making interview requests, she could go to the people who she knew had information on this topic or had been present when the, inter when the meeting had taken place. And it was, she was able to narrow down to a few people who eventually were willing to talk about uh, various issues surrounding corruption and ended up doing a great report on it. So that's one example of a way that you can start your research by using these operators. You can find other websites that are related to a site that you know. So this can be a good way to find other sources for stock footage. Um, it can also be a great way to find sites that are similar to your own or something that you're researching. It's also good for finding data sets and for verification. You can use the cache feature. This finds the most recently cached version. If you have um, the Wayback Machine, you don't need to use this in Google search. And of course, you can search for more than one keyword, people, places of things, and you can also search for file type, as I mentioned before. Okay, so if you've got your laptop open, you can have a go at it now. Um, I would like to know the speed of the Jaguar, the animal, not the speed of the automobile or the speed of the car. So how would you do that search? Anyone want to yell out? Oh, everyone's so quiet. You're the quietest group of journalists I've ever met. <laughs> yeah, great. Or is animal minus Jaguar speed, minus car, minus automobile. Yep, great. Um, okay, so uh, typically, let me just see, instant answers. Yeah, cool. So I'll just talk about instant answers. So that box of text you see at the top of the Google search results, those have been searched from a source that Google has verified. So when you're doing searches, um, and this is another one of the ways that Google is trying to combat fake news, the average user who's not a journalist and is not using um, Google search in this way, who just wants information quickly, Google is trying to serve them information that comes only from verified sources in the top part of the page. Um, so that's what that little box is. Most of you, your work will go much deeper than that, so you won't, um, sort of make much use of that. Okay, uh, we've done combinations of keywords. We'll skip past that. Okay, so top level domains, there's a great list of them, but um, I'll give you a couple of examples. Um, you could search for border protection in site alp.org.au. So that is the web, the top level domain of the Australian Labor Party. And um, if you were to search for that, you would come up with documents pertaining to their border protection um, policies. So you could you very easily, it's a great way to search for what opposition parties or smaller parties have in their policy documents and what they've published recently on an, an issue. Okay. Uh, you can find sites related to a given domain. So this helps you to, to give you a bit of situational awareness of what is going on. So um, for instance, you could try apple.com.au and then go related to apple.com.au and you get the other sites of similar um, uh, computer services in Australia. Okay, uh, cache link, I'll skip through that and file type we just did. Okay. Uh, uh, yep, so just covered all of that. Okay, uh, let me have a look. Okay, uh, yeah, so one of the um, things that we think that journalists do a fair bit of um, is searching on is what the competition is up to. So you can use searches in Twitter and searches on TweetDeck to have a look at what your um, competition news services are publishing. So uh, if you've used Twitter, you know that the search function in Twitter is really terrible. Google search does a much better job of searching twitter.com. Um, it, it's not so effective with other social media sites like Facebook because of the way privacy works on Facebook sites. But when I'm searching for something on Twitter, and actually, funnily enough, don't tell anyone, um, when I'm searching for stuff on my own university's website, I find that the Google search, advanced search is much better at, at finding documents that I'm looking for than the university's search engine. And it makes sense, right? Because Google is a company that's business is 
internet searching. So they're not developing a search engine for their website off on the side. That's their whole business. So of course their search results would be a lot more advanced. Okay, there are a couple of other um, uh, operators that I would like to draw your attention to. Define all in, all in title is great. So if you're searching for something like gone with the wind, that's full of a lot of really small, very common words. And some words like the are normally omitted from Google search as you're probably aware. Um, so if you can look for them all in title, or if you can remember roughly the title of a work that you're looking for, but you can't quite remember the specific title, all in title is another good one. Um, you can use dot, 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 to or dot, dot, in fact, to search for a range of numbers. So that's great if you're, and, and for a range of years as well, if you're looking for something that happened between 1996 and 1998, but you're not sure when. Um, you can search, you can use or terms like journalist or reporter, and um, you can use the asterisk as a wild card when you know only part of the phrase that you're trying to find. So, um, yeah, here we go. This is a great example here. A dollar saved is a dollar earned, common English expression. Okay, so um, if you're not big on remembering all of those operators, you can go to the Google advanced search page. So if you're just on the Google homepage here and you go down here and click settings, advanced search comes up for you. And the advanced search page allows you to um, not bother with any of those operators and just to pop them in there. It can be, it's probably quicker for most people to learn a few operators. They're a bit like keyboard shortcuts when you're editing video. They help speed your work up, um, but they're not, you know, if you can't remember them all, this is a great shortcut for you. Uh, getting to the advanced search page on your mobile phone is something that I'll just cover as well. So uh, when you're in Google, um, the Google app on your mobile phone, you can right click on the dot, dot, dot at the bottom or click on the dot, dot, dot. And um, it, the, an option comes up to open desktop site. That's a, a quick way of getting to advanced search. Um, Okay, so you can find out more at these links here. And again, I'll be providing all of this at the end of the presentation. So you can go back and have a look there. So once you've done a search for something and you wanna see those results again later. So if you're following a story over a number of days or weeks, this is, this is for you. Um, Google Alerts is a powerful tool that allows you stay on, to stay on top of things. Once you set it up, you'll get email notifications anytime Google finds a new result on a topic that you've set up an alert for. For instance, if you're covering a specific beat, if you're cre you can create alerts on relevant keywords that will help you stay up to date with emails that support your research. So our Hong Kong reporter from earlier who was reporting on corruption in the building industry on in Hong Kong, she could have set up an alert for a series of keywords relating to the building industry, you know, new projects that have been given the green light and so on, and she'd get an, an alert email about them. Um, if you're signed into Google, you might want to have a um, set up an alert for yourself. So when I worked in a busy newsroom, I found often I would file a story on Friday afternoon and I knew it was going to be published sometime on the weekend but I didn't know when. If I had an alert set up for my byline, then when that story was published, I'd get a notification and then I could tweet it out and share it on Facebook. So that's my, my favorite application. I was never a famous or controversial journalist. So people weren't writing stories about me, but if you're a commentator or you're um, very active in the Twitter sphere or you are, a controversial journalist, then it can be really handy to know when people are talking about you and a Google alert is a great way to set that up. Um, if you go to the Google alerts page, you can set up to, wow, that's really blurry, isn't it? You can set up to choose how often you receive results. Mm. Um, oh. When you're working on a story, oh. Google Alerts is a simple, powerful way to keep you in the know. Let's say you're covering the midterm elections and you want to stay up on all the coverage as it's happening. To create an alert, just enter the search words you want to get email notifications for. You'll get a quick preview of them down below. Then click Show Options to customize things like how often you get alerts, 
the types of websites and content you want searched, and the email address where you'll receive them. Then click Create Alert. In the Settings menu, you can customize when and how you get them. First, select what time you want to get your alerts. If you have more than one, you can select Digest to receive them all in one email. Now all you have to do is keep an eye on your inbox for your Google Alerts. Besides researching a story, you can also use Google Alerts to monitor your own work's impact. Just enter your byline, name, or website and get email notifications whenever someone shares or posts your work. Google Alerts is a great way to keep tabs on just about anything. Okay. Let's have, we'll have a very quick look at Google Trends. So Trends analyzes the popularity of search queries. It's a page that you can go to, Google Trends, and um, in that page you can compare the popularity of different search terms. So one way that journalists can use this is to see what people are searching for right now. Um, so it's, you know, Monday morning, it's a slow news day. You've got to publish three stories today. You can jump on Google Trends and see whether anyone really cared about the finale of the television show last night, or if people are actually more interested in what t-shirt Beyonce was wearing when she was spotted in California this week. Um, so it's, it's great for sort of doing light, quick stories like that. And um, it ranks the popularity of search terms on a scale from zero to 100. And it, in ranking them, it recognizes that uh, there was a lot less search volume in 2004 compared to now. So you can compare the popularity of, you know, William and Kate's baby compared to Harry and Meghan's baby in search terms. So um, I'm not going to spend too much time on this one, but I do. Uh, I just wanted to draw your attention to it because it's a really cool way of um, finding new stories. That's the um, trends page there. Down the bottom of this page, it's got loads of user guides and some great examples of how you can use it. Um, you can search trends in Kyrgyzstan, I checked last night. Um, so you can check global trends and also for a particular country or region. So it is a really great way of seeing what your audience is interested in right now. Um, let's see. Oh, yeah. It, the other thing it does is the Google News Initiative team, the Google News Lab, curates a set of topics. So if you're not um, looking for a particular story, but you just want to see what's generally of interest to people in your part of the world, you can have a look at what they've curated as the most interesting search um, topics recently. Most interesting trends. Where's my mouse? It's over there. Come back. Okay. All right, um, I'm just gonna show you the, uh, the outcome of one really cool Google Trends story that um, was done last year, if it will play. Oh no, it seems like it won't. That's a bit tragic, let me just go back and try that again. Ooh, does, has anyone seen bar chart races on Facebook recently? No? Okay, cool. I will have to send this to you as a link. It's obviously not playing. So um, my apologies for that. Okay. Uh, oh, here we go. Actually, I might be able to get it to play on this page. Oh, yeah, that looks good. Okay, great. So this um, is ranking the popularity of the characters' names as search terms. So they've just picked all of the main characters of Game of Thrones and then they've charted it over time. Which So this um, was developed using a tool which I'm not going to talk a lot about data journalism today, but see that up there, Flourish? That is a, um, a great tool for data journalists. If you know how to get a data set cleaned up and how to scrape data effectively, but you're not a graphic designer, Flourish offers a whole lot of automated design options for your data. It's free, it's available to all journalists, it's embeddable in all HTML pages, it doesn't have to sit inside your story, you can just embed it. So um, for those of you who are technically minded, what that means is that you don't have to have some kind of plugin for your news site to publish it. So um, there is one excellent example of it at work. 
And the last thing I want to show you on trends is this great story. Okay, so BBC Newsbeat created this story from Google Trends data. Oh, it hasn't. Oh, come on now. There we are. Cool. Um, so BBC created this story from Google Trends data, and actually, I'll just I'll go to the story itself if it's still live. Okay. So the five questions everyone was asking about Brexit. So um, another excellent example of how you can, if I can find my mouse, there it is, how you can um, put a story together from Google Trends data. So for all of you um, desk-based journos, I, I recommend that you um, get into Google Trends. Okay, so now we're going to get to the fun part. Verification. I wanted to show you all of those tools before we started on verification because um, many of them are really relevant to using in, in your um, attempt to verify. Um, oh dear. There we go. That's that actually working. So um, we did in the digital news report um, by the University of Canberra, we found that Australians are still have a very low level of digital media literacy. So what that means is that they're not very good at spotting fake news fake photographs and fake video. So it's still the responsibility to do that in our um, society at the moment rests with the journalist, unfortunately. Um, we found that only 31% of people understands who writes a press release. We found that only 20% know how news reaches them on social media. So they don't understand how the algorithms work on social media or how shares and likes work on sites like Facebook. We found that 52% knew which media organisations were publicly funded. Now, I ask my first year students this every year in Australia. We have two publicly funded media organisations in Australia and only about 10% of my students are aware of this before um, they start studying with us. So obviously we have a major problem with media literacy and this is a global phenomenon. I talk a lot about what's happening in Australia, but when I use Australia as an example, it's because Australia is typical of Anglophone countries. Okay, so this is what we're going to cover. So I'm gonna start with a little story about why verification is so important. Does anyone know what this road is? I would be surprised. Okay, this is about 50 kilometres south of Sydney. It's um, a really famous viaduct in the Royal National Park, which is the oldest national park in Australia. And it was built in the 90s because of landslide um, risk in that little cliff section there. Um, and it's, it's a real um, a famous landmark for Australians. So this is a Facebook post. Um, it's from... Uh, former President Marcos from the Philippines and he posted this and claimed that it was a public works project that was created in 1970 under martial law and it was an example of the kinds of projects that are possible under martial law. The image was shared over 24,000 times on Facebook and it had about half a million views. Um, the, the reason this is a problem is because this image was then used to justify the reintroduction of martial law by President Duterte a couple of years, 2017, um, in, during the uh, war on drugs. So Duterte was using martial law um, it, far more often than he could legally justify. But what he did very successfully was build a following on social media of people who believed that martial law was actually very good for the country. And this is part of the fake news machine. Rappler, the, one of the news organisations in the Philippines, estimates that Duterte has 40,000 Twitter bots at his disposal. So when he shares... Um, something on fake news, some item of fake news. He's got 40,000 bots that are able to share it out straight away. So before it lands in front of a human being, it's already massively popular. It might be trending on Twitter and there's already a significant following behind it. So when an average person with poor digital literacy reads that, they are less likely to question where it came from. 
So these are my um, sort of short tips on how to identify a fake. General knowledge is one of the keys that I've found in my work. I do quite a bit of verification work for news organisations in Australia. And I often find that it comes down to knowing that a species of tree in the background of a shot doesn't grow in that part of the world. Or looking at a photo of Moscow in January and there's no snow on the ground and knowing that that photo probably wasn't taken in that place at that time. Um, so keeping your general knowledge up to date and keeping across the news of the world is, is the number one thing that I tell my students. Um, if it makes you go wow, think first and share later. Um, any time I see something that surprises me on the internet, I verify it. I make a habit of verifying everything I share on social media. So I'm, I'm really active on Facebook. Some days I will share 10 things. Um, if, I, if any of those one things has come from a source other than two or three news organisations that I trust in Australia, and sometimes even with those sources, I still verify it, I will independently check whether or not that is correct information. Um, if there is something that tells you instinctively that it's weird or that it's a bit off, you should work out why and investigate that particular element of the image or video. Look for clues about geography and time. Could the image possibly be taken when they said and where they said? I'll give you an example. Uh, when the Bataclan attacks happened in Paris, I was working on the news desk and I was the only video journalist in Australia. It was a Saturday morning in Australia. Um, I was the only video journalist for my organisation in the country. So I had no editor. I just had the newspaper's editor working on the online desk. And um, I didn't have a team of people working with me for the first three or four hours of that um, particular attack. And what we were seeing was there were Reuters and um, Associated Press correspondents in Paris, but because it was the middle of the night, um, it took everybody a couple of hours to get up out of bed or leave the party that they were at and get to where that story was unfolding. So for the first two or three hours, our only source of information was social media. So we were looking at Twitter, YouTube and Facebook and seeing the material that people were posting. One video that came across my desk was a video that was shot from a hotel room. It appeared to be four stories or so up off the ground and it's in the dark so you can hardly see what's going on. You can hear automatic, automatic weapons fire and we did know that automatic weapons had been used in those attacks and you can see people running down the street. And the person who posted the video claimed that the video was taking place in Paris that evening. Um, it was in a part of the city that no other attacks had been reported on. And that was the only clue I had to wonder whether this video was legitimate. So I got online and using some of the tools I'm about to show you, I was able to find that that video had in fact been posted two years earlier on Facebook and it showed footage of a gunfight that had taken place in Beirut. So the video was not shot in Paris it, and it certainly wasn't shot on the night that it was posted. Posted. So that's one of the most common kinds of fake that we come across in my work in Australia. Um, okay, so look for signs. So anytime there's writing in a photograph, that is a great opportunity for you to verify. So um, there are also times of day and times of year that you should be aware of. That Moscow example that I gave earlier speaks to that. Look at the clothing that people are wearing in photographs. So if a photo has allegedly been taken on the streets of Tehran, that's going to have a very different set of people and dress in it than a photo that might have been taken in Sydney. Even if there's no other um, visual information in the photo that tells you where that photo was taken, the, just the clothing that people are wearing can give you strong clues. Architectural clues, these are my favourites. Architecture is, it can be, it's so unique from place to place in the world. It's almost always the last piece of the puzzle for me that allows me to, to verify something for sure. Um, in video, look at shadows. We'll be looking at an example of that. Shadows are very hard to get right. Um, in photographs, you should understand what is the easiest thing to manipulate and how somebody could have done it. So if you've got a photo of a politician holding a sign in and standing in a street and the 
the report is that that politician is in a city that they may or may not have been in um, and they're handing out and the sign says something really controversial on it. The sign is the easiest thing to manipulate, right? So they, they probably haven't taken the politician's head and stuck it on somebody else's body. They probably haven't cut out the image of the politician and put it on a different backdrop. The, the most likely thing or the easiest thing to have manipulated would be the sign. So that would be the first place that you would start to look. Then if you find that the sign looks pretty real, then you would look at those next more complicated things. And I'll give you a good example of that in a couple of minutes. Um, investigate every possibility as if you will find that it's a fake. So it's guilty until proven innocent. That's the mindset that you want when you're looking at video and photographic material that's come from social media. Then once you, you know, have proven beyond a shadow of a doubt, then you can treat it as innocent until proven guilty. Okay, um, checking for, so this is a great tool called Noam, noam.com. Um, you can check, so one of the first things that I recommend that you do is have a look at who posted the material and we'll get into that as we go into the video part of this presentation. Um, Noam is a great way to find all the other times that person has used that same username. So my name is Denby Weller. My surname is a little bit unusual. My first name is very unusual. I've never met another person called Denby. And I always use Denby Weller as my username. So if you search for me, in fact, that's what I've done here, you will find all of the social media sites where I've got a user account. So it's really easy to uh, identify if the person who's posted the video or image has an online life. If it's a fake account or a bot, you'll find relatively few of these. They are becoming more sophisticated, so you probably find a couple, but you're unlikely to find that that user has 10 other sites that they use with the same username. Not so effective if the name is very common, unfortunately. Okay, I'm sure you've all used Google Images before to do a search. I'll just draw your attention to a couple of great things. So you can search for images by color, which I really love. This, oh, oh, I have to go over there. So this one here. So these are how you refine your results when you do a Google image search. Um, so searching for the time or, that it was posted, searching for the usage rights. If you're looking for an image that you want to use in a news report, this is really handy for finding stuff that's under Creative Commons. And searching for the colour is really great for finding sepia and black and white images. So um, when you're looking for images on the web, this is a super handy tool. Um, again, as with advanced search, this is how you get to Google image search on your mobile phone. Um, just request the desktop site. And as I mentioned earlier, you can use um, other reverse image searches like TinEye. Okay, who knows where this is? Yeah. Um, if you plug this bridge into Google reverse image search, you would get that. So when you see, one of the things we do when we look at social media, video and photographs, like that um, instance from Paris that I explained before, is we make assumptions that the stuff is correct, right? We see it, we go, I recognize that, and then we don't question it a second time. So bringing that guilty until proven innocent attitude to your work is the number one step for you. There is another good example of this there is a bridge in New York that looks exactly like the Sydney, um, Sydney Harbour Bridge. So if you want to teach these tools, if you want to share them in your workplace, um, and if everyone's got their laptops with them, you can share that image and actually have people do the reverse image search on it once they've all said it's San Francisco. So that's a handy little tool for you. Okay. In June 2018, supporters of the former English Defence League leader, Tommy Robinson, protested in London after he was jailed for contempt of court. That really happened. The far-right Twitter account, Reality Smash, posted this photograph and claimed that it showed the whole of London calling for Robinson's release. The photo, which was taken by Martin Rickett at AFP, shows crowds gathered around St George's Hall on Lime Street in the centre of the city. Again, you can figure out pretty easily with Google reverse image search that the photo wasn't even taken on the day or at the time that the um, person claimed. Okay, 
Um, these are, so I'm, I'm going to leave this one with you. First Draft in Australia, so Anne Kruger is one of my colleagues at UTS. She works with First Draft News, who are the key body in Australia verifying video and images at the moment. And she has this um, excellent little framework that you can start to think about the kinds of fake news that you might encounter. And I'm just going to, I'll send us to a break in a minute, but before I do, I'll show you this one. This is really fun. So this, oh, and I, I did a reverse image search of it. Actually, I might just show you that in practice. Um, so, yes, let me bear with me one second. And I will show you how this actually plays out in life. So um, does anyone know what this image is from? No? MH, yeah, the, so it was claimed that it was the wreckage of the Malaysian Airlines MH17. Does anyone know where the image is really from? Yay, yep, the TV show Lost. So um, what they've done is superimposed the Malaysian Airline logo onto an aircraft from the, in the opening scenes of the show Lost. Um, I will show you. There we go. So that's the original on the right, and that's the doctored photo on the left. So I'm just going to use, if I can find my OneDrive. Um, verification images. Not that one. Not that one. Not that one. Oh, no. I might have put it somewhere else. Okay, you'll have to take my word for it. I'll pull this up over the break and I'll show you the search results after the break. So um, if you do an image search for this photo, the search results are staggering. There are more than 10 pages of news agencies around the world that showed this photo and said, look, they've found the wreckage. Um, so we'll go to a break now and I'll pull those results up for you so you can have a bit of a look at it. So this is the importance of the work that we're doing here today. And I, I really hope that in the second half of the session, we can uh, get the number of pages of search results. So now there are quite a few, um, like the Snopes, snopes.com, I'm sure you know about that. It's a, um, a website that debunks fake news. Um, so in the first page of results, now in 2020, you get a lot of these going, no, this photo is not real, this is a fake. But in 2017, when the photo first started circulating, the first 10 pages of results were all fake news outlets. So um, that's what we're up against. Okay, so this was apparently live drone action over Mosul. So this was posted um, uh, again to Twitter and Facebook um, and purportedly was this um, shot from a drone um, actually firing on enemy targets. What it actually was, was a screenshot from a computer game that was about to be released where you got to play the drone pilot in the game. And you can tell that there's something fishy with it when you first look at it because of that, right? Once you actually find the source of the image, you see that it's got a fire button, which is something that I'm pretty sure you don't see in drone footage normally. Okay, this, this is fascinating. This blew my mind when I saw it. So let's see if we can give it a moment to play. It got me thinking about my full-time Oh, their ability to survive. Let me just, oops, I'll go back. I'll reload that with some sound. Is that, was that the right speakers? Was that playing from the correct speaker? Okay, let me fix that. Uh, sound. Oh yeah, it should be right. It claims that it is. All right, let's try it again. It got me thinking about my full-time employees and their ability to survive on eight dollars an hour in New York City. It got me and foremost about in all of our minds has been the loss, their ability to grief, survive on, by the people eight dollars an hour in New 
New Most York of us City. Don't get our health Foremost in all of our minds has been the loss and the Fortune grief Medicare, felt by the people of Orlando. And what you should know is Most that don't thanks to the Affordable Care Act, your coverage is better today than it was before. Medicare, Women can get free checkups. And what you should know is that get thanks to the Affordable Care Act, for being your coverage is better today than it was before. Women can get free checkups. A bill that would boost care and charge more. Just for some progress, at least within the small confines of the legal community. I think it's real important. Some progress, at least within the small confines of the legal community. I think it's real important. Here we go. Make sure uh, President Barack Obama. A lot of pauses. Uh, America's businesses have created 14.5 million sure new jobs know. over 75 straight pauses. months. We are developing America's technology. Every technology can be used uh, in some negative way, and so we all should work towards uh, making sure that technology, not every technology can and be used uh, even, uh, in one of the negative ways. And so we all should once work you know towards uh, making sure that you know how to reverse engineer it. And uh, even so you can uh, one of the interesting directions uh, and so is that once you know how to create, I think you know how to reverse engineer it. And so you can um, real uh, and so one could um, uh, create methods for okay, identifying so um, AI is now being uh, used to make lots of fake videos, um, real but videos. luckily for us, it's no good at making cats. Um, so we're, we're still safe. Our cat videos are safe. Okay. So when you're verifying videos on YouTube, one of the things you want to um, look at is the YouTube search, which is run by Google. So it's quite a good search engine. Um, and one of the things that people often forget to look at when they're looking at YouTube videos is who put the video up. So if you can't verify the video itself, you can, you maybe will be able to verify the identity, identity of the person who posted the video. Um, another great tool to look at is this was developed by Amnesty International and Google now um, funds its ongoing existence. It's called the YouTube data viewer. So what it shows you is the um, date that the image, that the video was uploaded, the time it was uploaded, and it will give you more information about the video file type um, and the identity of the um, uploader. And then it also, picks up five or six still images from inside the video, just randomly selects them. And it um, image searches those, reverse image searches them on Google. So if this video has appeared anywhere else, or if it's images, the, the stills in it have been used as stills in a news report or any other website, this can be a good um, search for you. It's not conclusive. Okay, now we're going to have a look at a fun video and you can tell me what you think of it. YouTube. So it's 9 million and one today. And I'm sure most of those 9 million were people who thought it was real. Um, what did you notice about it that made you go? Mm. Yeah. The way the bear was moving. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, great. Yeah, there's repetition in the animated bear. What else? I promise you're right. Yep. Anything else? Yep. You no. Yep. No. Yep. 
Yes, good. Yeah, absolutely. And does anyone else notice that the chorus of that song just seems to go on and on and on and on? And like it's just a whole, the whole song is chorus. Right. Um, the bear appears. What was that? Oh, okay, cool. The bear appears, uh, it's a very, you know, it's a snowy day and it's really misty, but the bear is quite clear in some of the shots. And that was something I noticed. It looks too clear for the distance that it supposedly is behind her. Somebody else has done some work on this and they um, calculated the speed that the bear was running based on the steepness of the slope. And they decided that the bear was running to like 70 miles an hour or something. Um, and so he couldn't possibly be running that fast. So that, I'm not expecting you to go into that kind of verification, um, but you, you know, that's a possibility. Okay, um, the best, the most conclusive way to um, identify that this is a fake video is the fact that the bear disappears in a couple of frames. So if, remember I showed you frame by frame, the YouTube frame by frame viewer at the very beginning? Um, if you watch this video one frame at a time, I can't do that with you today because it will take too long. Um, you'll see that the bear is there in that frame there. And then in the very next frame, the bear has disappeared. So um, frame by frame is a great tool for this kind of um, thing. Okay, and you can also look at the image data. So um, Jeffrey's image metadata viewer is another tool like that Amnesty International um, metadata viewer that gives you the information that is saved along with the video, like the time of upload, where it was uploaded from, um, the format of the video, all of these can be clues. Okay, um, this is a video from Vice um, who, claim, who posted it online and they actually did a live video with this guy and they didn't realize when they were posting it that it was, um, so this guy was in hiding, John McAfee, and it was possible for people to identify where he actually physically was because of the GPS coordinates that were posted in the video metadata. So um, if you use Google Maps, you're able to identify the exact location that that video was shot. And using Google Satellite View, you can compare the satellite view of the house with the background of the video and go, yep, that pool is in the right place, it's the right shape, that looks pretty good. And um, if you're the Guatemalan police, then you can go and try and arrest this guy who's in hiding. I won't show you that video, that's of him realizing that they've just posted his location. Um, okay, so Google Maps can be a really great tool. Everybody uses Google Maps to find directions, but there are some other really um, important tools for using, that you can use with Google Maps. Um, one of the first is the satellite view. So when you see a photograph and you're trying to establish whether or not it was taken in the place that it claims to have been taken in, the 3D version of the satellite view can be really handy for identifying things like if the perspective is up high, if it's a fourth story window that they've taken the photo from, um, is there a building that's tall enough in that street that they could have taken the photograph from? So this is about how you compare the information that's with the, that comes with the image. You can also, um, if you right click or on a Mac, it's command click, um, you can measure the distance between two objects in a straight line on any Google Maps image. So that can give you an idea. If a person claims to have shot a photograph with an iPhone, for instance, that has a fixed lens, and they were standing 100 metres away from the subject of the photo, then it's clear that that person was not in that place at that time. So measuring distance can be helpful. Um, these are some of the 3D views. So Google is going through all of its global mapping resources right now and, and computing everything into 3D. It's going to be a timely process. Um, I don't know when they're planning to do it here or if it's already come to Bishkek, um, but it will be global. And for instance, they've done Mount Everest. And at the end of the session today, I'll show you a really great flyover that's been done. So it's been all over the place. That's Yosemite Valley. Um, that's an underwater Google Maps on the Great Barrier Reef in Queensland. Um, they've, yeah, been to some 
pretty cool places. All right, so I'm going to give you a couple examples now of um, videos that I've verified or video or that I've been asked to verify. And we're going to start with this one. SBS News is one of the big news producers in Australia. They contacted me in May 2019 and said there's a sex tape going around um, on social media in Malaysia and it claims to be the um, minister who is about to run, Minister for Economic Affairs, who is about to run for president and one of his aides. And homosexual sex is illegal in Malaysia. So if this guy is in fact the guy in the video, it's the end of his political career. Um, and also they can go to jail. In fact, I think they can be um, shot for homosexual sex, it's, it's quite serious. So I'm gonna show you some scenes now from the tape. I'm just gonna tell you first, there's nothing explicit in what I'm showing you today. Um, there was nothing explicit in the tapes at all. Everything happened under the covers, um, but you are gonna see the, the top half of two naked men. Okay, so the video is terrible quality, right? Um, the video was shot vertically. And what I looked at was an, a two minute cut down of a video that had clearly been shot from daytime through nighttime to daytime. So um, first of all, I know that the video producer has edited the video. Secondly, when you see vertical video, it's normally been shot with a mobile phone. But I know that you can't shoot continuously with a mobile phone for 14 hours unless it's plugged into something. So those were two um, re immediate red flags for me that had me go, mm, I don't know if this is real or not. Um, it, it looks a little bit, it's a little bit easier to see what's happening on the screen, on my screen than it is on this projector, but it, it was still very poor quality. You can see it's quite heavily pixelated and the, the men's faces are a little bit blurry, but they didn't look like they'd been doctored. It just looked like bad quality video to me. And you know, a, a small camera at night time with, low, with poor low light sensitivity, I thought that it, there was no immediate red flag there. So I started looking at the details in the photograph. Um, we know when it was posted, it was posted on the 11th of May, and the person who posted it claimed that the video took place on the night of the 10th of May. Um, we also knew that the politician um, appeared in a rally in a particular city in Malaysia on the night of the 10th of May. So I started looking at details in the video and wondering whether he could actually, um, like what hotel it was shot in basically. So there's a photograph of him at the rally on the night of the 10th of May. And so Sandakan is the name of the city. So I started looking for hotels in Sandakan. I used advanced search, um, five-star hotel. I assumed he was staying in a five-star hotel. He's a minister of the government. That's what would happen in Australia. And I searched booking.com because I had recently been planning a holiday and I was shocked at the number of photographs that a five-star hotel will put on their website of when they're trying to get people to come and stay. So this was the search result that I got. And um, I clicked through to the first one, the ad, the booking.com thing. And this was the first hotel that came up. So that's the original um, uh, ad over there with the umbrellas and the pool side. So I clicked on that. I, you know, I assume maybe it could be the four points. I don't know. And I was willing to do this for as many hotels as it took to find this backdrop. So I saw this bed head here and it had striking similarities to the bed heads in the, um, the video. So just take a closer look at it. So I'd like you to have a look at the, this detail here, this lamp. And then the, um, the way the light is moving on that um, maroon bit there, the texture here and the texture of the bedspreads. So um, in the back of the shot, you can barely see it, is this little vertical post here that looks just like that lamp. There's your maroon. So now looking at them side by side, they, it's, it's really clear that it's the same location, isn't it? And it, that's quite a unique feature. I did end up comparing this against all the other hotels in Sandakan just to make sure that 
this is not like a local Sandakan feature. This was particular to this hotel and it was indeed particular to this hotel. And then you can see the pattern on the sheets here is a match for the pattern on the bedspreads. The last circle I have over there answered the first question that I had. So there's a television um, which is in the exact position that the camera would have been positioned in to shoot the video. And what I noticed about the TV is that it's got this big black frame around it. And if I was to shoot um, this video, that's where I would mount my camera. If I was using a GoPro, which can shoot continuously for a, a whole night, I would mount it sideways. So that's why we had a vertical video, even though it wasn't shot from a mobile phone. Um, now, I contact, the SBS contacted me on a Friday afternoon about this. I did this, it took about two hours to get this result. And I came back to them and I said, I'm pretty sure that this is in fact the minister in the video. Uh, he was in that city that night. This is the hotel the video was shot in. And I, I think if you did some further digging, you'd find that he stayed in that hotel. Um, SBS are very cautious. They're a great news organization. So they didn't publish the story. They held it until Monday morning. And on Monday morning, the young man in the video, the aide, came forward and admitted that the video was him and the minister. So um, that was one case where we were, you know, able to get to the bottom of the story. Here's another. So this is a more hypothetical example. When I was learning verification, I got shown this um, photograph and asked to identify where in the world the photograph was taken. So, as I said to you earlier, I had a look at the clothing that the people were wearing. Um, I also had a look at the words in the photo. So that's a spa mart, that red sign there. If you've ever shopped in European convenience stores. Um, we have those in Australia. I've seen them around the world. Do they, do they have them in Canada? Right. Okay, cool. So I knew that spa marts weren't just European because we've got a couple of them in my country. So it wasn't enough to go, oh, okay, that was shot in Europe just because most of them would be there. And then the last and most important detail is in the top right of the photograph, there's a reflection of some words. The words are backwards. I'm not great at reading backwards. So I flipped the photograph around, which on a Mac you can do with one click in preview. Um, on a PC, you just need a photo editing program to do it. It's super easy, quick thing to do. Um, the other thing that was, the other two details that I noticed were the dark flooring. So a lot of airports that I've been to have tiled floors, but I don't remember being to one recently that's got black floors like that. So I thought if I could find um, a building, a place, an internal building that might have a spa mart in it. So I'm thinking airport, bus terminal, doesn't look like a shopping centre to me, doesn't look like the kind of shop that would be in a shopping centre. Um, so that was where I first went with it. And black tile floors and then these weird things here, those architectural details. I thought they were pretty unique and that if I could identify those, I would have a good chance. But I started with the words. So I flipped the photograph around <laughs> And you can't really see it there, but you probably can see that, that there's a three there quite clearly. Yep, that was the first letter that I noticed. And I started, um, I started wondering what three, what would come before three? And this word here says terminal, which is a bit hard to see on this screen. But after looking at it for ages and ages, I was able to read that. And so I did some Google searching. Um, Terminal 3 Spa Mart was my search. And instead of looking for the results, I went to the Google image results with this guy just here. And I saw one there that had the black dot above it. And I was like, cool, that's definitely my Spa Mart. So I clicked on that image. This took 10 minutes, this verification. And I got this page on TripAdvisor. Um, so you can see it's definitely got those dots above it. It's a spa mart and it's got black shiny um, tiles on the floor. And over there it says we're in Terminal 3, Arrivals, Level, level 0. And then it says Schwerschat 1300. I don't know where Schwerschat is. So I Googled that and it turns out that it's in Vienna. So that's the location there of the photograph. So just using those few pointers that I gave you earlier in the session, right? How are we going? 
Okay, so another great tool that you can use is Street View. So Street View is indexed over time as well. So one of the things you can do with Street View is look back in time at what a location looked like once before. Um, so this is great for, for doing journalistic stories. This is a great little um, GIF that you could add into a story. Um, but it also gives you an opportunity to go to places that you can't physically go to. Um, Street View is moving inside buildings at the moment. So uh, you can get Street View shots inside popular destinations like shopping malls, famous buildings, um, museums, art galleries. It's gone into the Louvre, for example, in Paris. Um, so you, it gives you a great chance now to verify not just externally shot images, but also images that were shot indoors. Um, okay, and this is what you can do with it looking back in time. Uh, so what this journalist has done is grabbed the street view shot of this building that burned down on Sunday morning and then they've gone and tried to shoot the exact same shot just with their mobile phone by standing opposite after the fire. So then they've got a before and after image. So that's a really powerful way to add some visualisation into your stories. Um, here similarly is a before and after image of a fire. Um, okay. And you can, uh, yeah, yeah, and you can sort of identify. So architectural details are one of the, the best things to identify through Street View, but landmarks and monuments are another one. The other thing you can do is start to work out if a, if a person shot a photo or video and they claim to be standing in a particular location, you can see whether there is actually line of sight to what they shot. So um, in situations like the, the morning I reported on Paris, when people said that they were standing out the front of the Bataclan and I saw buildings in the background of their shot, I used Street View to establish just whether that was possible or not. So um, it's a great, uh, great tool just for when you think something is right but you need to triple check it. This is um, one of my favourites. Okay. I'm going to skip that one. Oh, yeah. And so, yeah, another thing is you can cross-reference building features. So there's a great example there of we've got a photo that claims to have been taken in a particular location. And if you have a look using satellite view, you can definitely establish that those um, building features are all nearby each other. So, you know, one of these alone, like the mosque and the minaret, wouldn't be enough. But when you put the mosque and the minaret beside this apartment building there, then you start to see that you, you, it's very unlikely that you would see that exact correlation of images in some other location. It's not conclusive. None of what we do should end up in a court of law, in my opinion. You should, people shouldn't go to jail based on my verification work. Um, and they shouldn't, you know, have real world consequences. But I do think that it's sufficient to make the decision about whether or not to publish. And as a journalist, that's where my um, key responsibility is. And that's the thing that I'm most preoccupied with. Um, okay, oh, this, I love this one. So um, this was a social media post um, there is a, a war going on in Australia with water rights and water usage. Um, we have a number of rivers that flow from one state into another. And the, the state that's always downstream is South Australia. So this was posted um, saying, we are serious about being the driest state. Don't you go bringing your grass over here. So, you know, a bit of a joke at the end there. But what they're saying is, um, that because of water usage rules in the neighbouring state, which is Victoria in this case, um, the state of South Australia doesn't have enough water to irrigate its crops. So in that photo, we've got this really distinctive set of um, reservoirs, like a water treatment facility down the bottom there. And so um, using Google Satellite View, we're able to establish that the border between Victoria and South Australia is in fact where the border appears to be in this photograph. So that's, you know, the first step and, and from that step it looks like it's a pretty legitimate photo. But then zooming out a little bit further, we start to see the real story. So what we're actually looking at with this water feature just here is the border of a private property. 
This straight line, the border in the original photograph, does correspond with the state border. But what we've got here is a property that has water rights and a property that doesn't. So it's not what the original report suggested. It's not the, the case that this state on the right of the screen is all dry and the state is all um, well irrigated and the state on the left is all dry. What is in fact the case is this, this is a private property that just for whatever reason has more water on it. Okay, oh, we're getting through it. Um, I'm going to finish just with a quick um, explanation of Google Earth and Google Studio. Um, so Google Earth has been going around creating um, really detailed satellite imagery. It, it, in about 2017, you started to see journalists, organizations around the world picking up on this and using it. There were a lot of stories done about the internment camps in the Xinjiang province in China. Um, because we couldn't get journalists in there, but we could get satellite view of those camps being built and established and um, the movement of people. There have also been some great stories about the Rohingya refugee crisis, where Google satellites have shown um, the movement of large numbers of people. So this is a, an excellent opportunity for a multimedia journalists to add some visualization into their stories. Um, I'm going to just skip through and show you how it works. So this is Google Earth Studio, which used to cost money. And last year, Google made it free for all news organizers. Well, it's free for everybody, in fact. Um, so you can down, what you can do is take a flyover. So you can get yourself into the Google Earth world and start flying over and having a look at locations and record a video of that. And then you can use that video in your news stories. And I'll give you a quick example. Um, Quarrying to Everest. How good's my typing? Not very. That's the one. Okay, so this was produced in, I want to say, April or May last year. <coughs> okay, here we go. So all of this imagery that you're seeing here, remember I said that Google Street View had gone up Mount Everest? So th that's what this vision is from. So the... Um, you may or may not remember the story. I'm not sure if it made a big splash here. Just let that photo load. Oh, no, not that one. Okay, so the journalists, so uh, I'll, I'll t give you the background of the story first. A photograph was published on social media showing a bunch of people climbing Mount Everest and there's like a queue of people. It was really stunning image. It's the last image of this story. Um, so the journalist team, it was a data journalist um, a designer, visual journalist, and a, the writer, the correspondent for South Asia for the ABC, who is based in Delhi. Um, they got together and said, let's do a story about what it's like to climb Mount Everest and how such a thing could ever possibly happen. So the designer who put this together thought that um, it would be really interesting to actually track the route that people take when they climb Everest and to look at where they stop and camp. And there we go. So they call this the death zone. That's where the photograph was taken. Do you remember that image? A few nods around the room. Yep, cool. Um, and then we go from this, that's just a shot of a guy on the summit, into a data investigation. So I said a data journalist was one of the team members. So she got really interested in why more um, Sherpas die than white people who are climbing the mountain. So she did a huge investigation. There was a, a public data set available and she looked into it called the Himalayan database. She looked into when people die, where they die, who they are and what their causes of death are and did this great data piece about it. This whole story was put together in six days. It got six million views on ABC online, which is a huge engagement um, number. 
for Australia. You, the whole country is 20 million people. So that's a lot of Australians who saw this. And the average engagement time on the story was also very high. So people stayed on the story for an average of six minutes. And that is an, an unusually high number for ABC stories. So they really got the bang for their buck from using um, Google Earth Pro. Where's my, there we go. Cool, Google Earth Studio, I beg your pardon. Okay, um, I'm just gonna click through to that and show you. So um, if you're interested in learning more about this kind of, this is called open source investigations. So all the tools I've shown you today are available for anybody to use. Um, if you're interested to learn more, this is the person who did the training with me when I learned it, Owen Sweeney. And he runs this site here, osintessentials.com. He's also very active on Twitter and he tweets out all the new tools that are developed. So if this is an interest of yours or an area you'd like to explore, that's where you can find more information. Um, and now, so this is where to go to get more from the Google News Initiative, Google News Training. And you can find um, video tutorials and documents, PDFs to download and other online training resources to teach you how to use any of these materials. And then once everyone's got a photo of that. Okay. Um, all right. So if you've got questions about a tool, you can email the Google News Labs. Um, you can learn how to use the tools at those two sites. And then you can also, um, if you're interested to go to this link and let us know what you thought of the training, next time I come out, I can incorporate any suggestions that you have. Like if you wanted to see more case studies from Kyrgyzstan or from Central Asia, I can take all of that feedback for next time I come out. Okay, so that's the end of the Google News initiative. What I'm going to do now is just talk you through, I'll, actually I'll, I'll ask you what you would like. I've got two possible, we're going to talk for another 15-20 minutes and then we're going to have questions. Um, I can either give you a, a brief history of multimedia journalism or I can talk to you about when you would choose to do a multimedia story and then what story elements you would look for and how you would construct a multimedia story. What would you like to hear more of? The second option? Great. Okay. I love this one. Ba, ba, ba. Cool. Oh, see, it's gone to sleep. That's my great suspender at work. Okay. Well, let's do a fade. That'll be nice. Great. Okay. All right, so the first question you wanna ask is why would you go multimedia? Um, in Australia, multimedia has become a bit of a buzzword and we've definitely gone through a period where every online news site wanted to produce every story using multimedia. But multimedia is more time consuming to make. It often requires a bigger team than a story that is you know, two media or single media. It requires more of the audience's time to consume it. And sometimes it requires the audience to be in a different place. So some multimedia stories play really well on mobile. Um, and we know that the bulk of our news consumers consume while they're on their commute to work in the morning. That's one of the big spikes in Australia. So I'm, I'm not sure if these figures hold for um, Kyrgyzstan, but in Australia, most people catch public transport to work. So they, read a lot of news on the bus and the train. Uh, and then after dinner, we also see a spike in news consumption. So um, if you're doing a multimedia piece that requires, for instance, if it's got 360 video and the person has to go like this with their phone, they're not gonna do that on the train, right? So you need them to be highly invested in the story so that they see it in the morning on their commute and they then remember to come back to it in the evening. We are seeing that that is a typical audience behavior with, with multimedia stories, but, um, or sometimes they'll view it later in the day when they're at their desk at work. Um, but the story has to be sufficiently impactful for the audience member to want to come back to it. So the big question to ask before you embark on how to do multimedia is should you really 
do multimedia? Does your story warrant it? So to answer that question, we have to do a bit of analysis of the news spectrum. So over on the left hand side, we have breaking news stories. So what characterizes them is that they're faster to make, faster to consume, they're less considered, so less you know, time goes into thinking about the story, and they're typically made by a smaller team. So in Australia, a lot of breaking news is done by a team of one, and it's usually edited by one person, although that is not always the case at small, in smaller newsrooms. Sometimes the journalist is publishing direct to the audience without the intervention of an editor. So on social media, that's very common. Then we have feature stories, podcasts, and about in the middle of the spectrum, we've got multimedia journalism. So it's longer form journalism, but it's not long form journalism. I just showed you that Everest story. That's a 3000 word story. Um, you know, I would consider a long read to be 5000 or above. And I would definitely think that a long read takes longer to consume than an average multimedia story. So it's kind of in the middle. Then over here, we've got documentary series, docu-series and podcast series. So these ones are slower to make. They're consumed over multiple sessions. That's these ones right at the end here. Um, they're very intentional. I'll get back to that. And they have a bigger team. So I, I'm writing a textbook about multimedia journalism at the moment. Um, I'll be doing that for the rest of this year. And as part of my research, I'm interviewing about 50 multimedia journalists and scholars around the world. And I ask all of them this question. It's my first question for them. So this guy up the top here, Richard Kochi Hernandez, is at the Berkeley um, School of Journalism at the University of California. And he is like the guy on the planet in terms of multimedia scholarship at the moment. He's written the most about it. His theories have been the most impactful in journalism education. And he's a household name. So he talks about this idea of intention. And what he says is that you can't just throw together a multimedia story you have to plan it as a multimedia piece from before you start news gathering I'll come back to that um, the data journalist who did the ABC story that I just showed you Everest her name is Inga Ting she's the leading data journalist in Australia um, when I asked her this question she said it has to be beautiful and she is talking about visually beautiful so not just a story that you know is heartwarming but something that is visually beautiful to look at. Um, I thought it was very interesting that a data journalist would give this answer. I would expect someone like me, a video journalist or a um, photo journalist to give this kind of answer. Um, but Inga, you know, as a data journalist, her business is numbers and she still recognized that as being really important. I say that the narrative must be compelling. I have a story first approach in my work and I always come back to what is the story and is it important enough to give this kind of treatment to? Do it, does the audience care enough about it to give me 10 minutes of their day or six minutes of their day? So let's tell us, let's have a look at what history tells us about compelling narratives. We know what we know about storytelling from literary criticism and film criticism. A lot of journalists are really uncomfortable talking about this idea of narrative and story because people have an idea that it takes us away from truth telling. And truth telling is of course the most important thing that we do as journalists. But we also are in a conversation with an audience and we're in a competitive marketplace for their attention. It's never been as competitive for people's attention as it is now. So in my view, it is, absolutely critical to talk about the quality of narrative and narrative structure as part of our work. I'm not saying that I think we should change the facts to suit the narrative, to suit, you know, the narrative requirements of the audience. I'm not suggesting that we should exaggerate or omit facts. But what I am saying is that we should identify the elements of the story that are going to help the audience care about what we do. So we talk about story elements. The elements must be strong, these elements must be strong to make a compelling narrative. It must have a compelling setting or location that is clear to the audience. So if we did that Everest story without making the setting of Mount Everest, sorry, softly, slowly, oh, thanks. Okay. 
if we did that story at Mount Everest and we didn't at the beginning of the story, take the time to tell the audience and show the audience where we are, that story would be less impactful for them. In film theory, we talk about continuity of place and time. So this just means that audiences are more receptive to a story that takes place over a short period of time in as few locations as possible. It gives them less to worry about. Each time you change locations, you have to orient the audience to the new location and that takes up storytelling time. So if you have a huge set of events taking place and you want to do it as a multimedia story, it can be helpful just to choose one element of that narrative to communicate as a story. So let's say you're covering the Rohingya refugee crisis in Myanmar. Instead of focusing on the whole crisis, the millions of people who were displaced, all of the different violence, all of the different events that took place, you could tell the story of one survivor. So that's what I mean when I say that you can bring it down to a good continuity of time and place. Action in film, plot or narrative. The action needs to matter a lot. So one thing we see a lot in Australia with unsuccessful multimedia stories is that the journalist has chosen a story that not many people are interested in. So it, it, it's a story with low stakes. So if the story has low stakes, the audience might initially respond to beautiful images, but they very quickly lose interest and you have low engagement scores. The story has to have some drama for an audience to stay engaged until the end of it. So I would say life and death stories are the most appropriate stories for multimedia treatment. Um, I'm doing a story about the Australian bushfires at the moment. And I've, so to give you an example of continuity of place and time, that's a big, big story. I know about one street in one town where every house should be gone. And because of the actions of a few firefighters and a few local people that night, there was no loss of property. There's also footage on YouTube of the fire coming towards this one street and the fire is three times higher than the buildings. And it's, it's just unbelievable when you see the footage to think about how those houses could possibly have been saved. So instead of treating the whole bushfire crisis with this story, I'm really focusing on one house that was saved. So I found the firefighters that saved the house. I found the guy that owns the house and I found the video footage of the house, of the fire literally at the back of the house, like the, the back door was burned, but the house is still there. And that's the one little kernel that I'm taking from this whole big story to tell. And I'm pretty confident that that will be successful, reasonably confident. Um, it's, gotta ha it's gotta happen to people. So again, with the Rohingya refugee crisis, People care less about a big global crisis that they can't put their, they can't put a human face on, right? Once you've got one character, then you've got the beginnings of a multimedia story. You can have more than one. You don't have to have a central protagonist. Like, for example, in film, it is common to have a single central character. You can have more than one character with a multimedia story, but it is helpful to keep it to as few characters as possible. To give you an example, it's a little outside of journalism. Um, who cared as the world cared much less about uh, climate change before Greta Thunberg was the activist for climate change, right? She is the one character who is so clearly affected by that story. She has a massive following because people care about what happens to her. And it's, it makes it much more accessible for them than a big global issue like climate change that they just can't relate to a single person. Okay. It's all pretty obvious stuff, I know. Um, okay, we express these different story elements through our structure. 
So I've talked about story elements. That's what is present naturally in the story. Now I'm going to talk about the elements of the, of the structure, the structural elements of the multimedia package. So video, photographs, text, sound. Okay. So if you have a complex idea, it still works best to communicate it with text. If it takes the audience a little while to understand the significance of the story, then text is still the best way to bring them into complex ideas. Still images are great for setting the scene and also for conveying slow and powerful moments. So a still image taken during the Hong Kong riots can give us way more emotional impact than a bit of video, a chaotic video shot during the riots. Um, so don't neglect the emotional power of stills. I still believe that still images are primarily a narrative, emotive form. Video is great for strong characters. So if you're interviewing somebody and they're great, they're a great storyteller, get them on video. Even if you don't use the video in the end, it's, it's a great resource for you to have and it gives you options. Um, videos are also really good for communicating change. So when there's been change to a landscape, if there's a lot of movement, if there's change in a person's physical presence as a result of the story, video is still, I think, the most powerful tool we have for communicating that. Audio creates atmosphere and connect, connects with emotions. Everyone has heard a song before and it takes them back to some memory in their past, right? Audio has this really fascinating power to connect with our emotional um, sort of being. And it works, it can work in the background. So this is why films put music behind sad moments, right? They want to heighten the emotional power of that moment. Now in journalism, we don't use music typically in that way because it's considered emotionally manipulative, but we, we can use sound design to heighten um, and the emotional impact of a moment. So um, I also recommend when you're news gathering, as I said, when you're interviewing people, always shoot the video. When you're news gathering, I think you should always record a lot of audio as well. So I always have my phone. I like, I, I feel a bit naked today because I left my microphone in the hotel when I left this morning. So that should give you an idea of how often I carry the gear with me. It's just a little $80 lapel microphone that plugs into my phone. Um, but it's great for recording interviews with people and also the sounds of places. So whenever I'm news gathering for a story, the um, first two things I think about are getting atmospheric video, setting the scene, and getting atmospheric sound. Um, it is not as common in multimedia stories now to play looping sound in the background. We used to do that a lot, but it's gone out of, um, out of vogue, out of fashion. Um, but I still record audio to be used, not necessarily in that application, but in whatever um, application I can find during the story. Okay, so our approach goes, we find a story that matters enough to do it in multimedia. We identify the elements of the story. We choose which structural elements will best represent the story elements. We think about our audience. Where are they? Who are they? When are they tuning in? We'll get back to this. And then we look at resources. So let's go to planning our multimedia elements based on our story elements. I think I've covered all of that. Use sound design. Yes, yes, cool. I'll skip that one. Okay, so knowing your audience is the a fourth part of the puzzle. So for the, the example I gave earlier, you don't use 360 video if you know that your audience is gonna be on the bus when they're watching your um, multimedia piece. So you need to also know how technically savvy your audience is. If your audience doesn't um, intuitively understand how to scroll through a story, you might have to include visual cues to tell them what to do. If they use, use, usually watch video with the sound off, you might have to include a little visual signal at the start of the video saying, hey, please turn on the sound. So you need to have a think about who the audience is, what age they are, and what consumption patterns they have before you start your story design. I've already covered when, 
we'll be seeing. One, one last thing I'll say about that is we know that um, graphic, violent, um, disturbing images don't play well before lunchtime. So there's a lot of research on that. Audiences are less likely to engage in that kind of story early in the morning when they first wake up. So if your story contains those elements, you need to think about how you could hook them in the morning while they're on their way to work or sitting on the, bar on the toilet or lying in bed and get them to come back and then engage with your story after dinner. So you would think about it then as a teaser and a story. You would put the teaser at the beginning and you would engage them sufficiently that they want to come back later, but you wouldn't open with those graphic images. Um, where will they see your story? We covered that. And why are they interested? So um, this is really critical. We know that audiences like lighter entertainment in the morning and they're more interested in public interest stories in the evenings. So if your story is a public interest story, you need to think again about how you could hook them in the morning and bring them back in the evening. Maybe finding that great storytelling character that you could you know, open the story with somebody very entertaining so that they can get their morning entertainment fix and be interested enough to come back later. The last thing you need to think about is resourcing. So I always advise people to work backwards from the most complex resources they need. So if you're um, making video, you need to think first about who's gonna edit your video if you're not a video editor. So if you don't have that lined up, you shouldn't shoot any video. If you're making a story that requires a, a really nice map visualization and you're not a graphic artist, you need to line up who is going to do the map for you before you start your news gathering. If you're um, doing a story that needs a heavy design input, then think about getting that designer on board before you pick up a camera. Okay, so the planning process, story, element, structure, audience, resources. And I think that's that. Yes. Now let's look at some examples. I might just stop there. I, I can send you a list of examples after the presentation. There are some amazing pieces of multimedia work around at the moment. Um, so maybe rather than showing you some exciting stuff now, I might just stop for some questions. We've got 15 minutes to go. And then if you run out of questions, I can show you some examples live. All right. Who would like to go first? I've got it here. Oh, wow. Oh, cool. Thank you. Is it on? Yes, yes, yes. Yes. Слышно? Или нет? I'm not sure. He's not speaking. Yes. Ah. Yeah. Uh, cool. У меня такой вопрос. Допустим, вы вот делаете мультимедийные материалы, да? Uh, скажем так, uh, видео вам, которое требуется, то есть оно в интернете, и вам необходимо скачать и вставить. А как в этом случае у вас работает там авторское право? Как вы поступаете в этом случае? А, ah, good question. We always seek permission. We always seek permission to use videos. Um, oh, I'm going to take that off. Um, and in Australia, you can use video um, that is under copyright under a fair dealing exception. In America, it's called fair use. So if you are reporting the news and you must use that video and it, there is a clear reason why the video is essential for the story, then um, you, uh, you can use the video without permission. However, as a first step, we always seek permission first. Um, so you would only use a video without permission as a last resort. 
Um, I don't know what the law is in Kyrgyzstan, but that's the law as it stands in Australia. And we, we have lawyers in newsrooms who make sure that we're doing the right thing. Super. Oh, really? Okay, cool. Very clear. Oh, yeah. Well, it's not the question really, but you already mentioned this a few more notes. Sorry, this is intimidating. <laughs> Imagine how I feel. <laughs> <laughs> so, you already mentioned in your uh, presentation that you see no conflict uh, in terms of not being biased. As, a, as an author, as a journalist, mm -hmm. right? Uh, when you pick a character, when you pick a person to speak in your story. But for me, it's always a big dilemma. Mm. Uh, I always feel um, like my person does not represent the statistics, that does not represent the situation. And by picking the person to speak in my story, I... Um, I stay biased and I provide this bias coverage, how to deal with it. Yeah, it's a great question. Thanks for asking it. Um, this is really central to the work that I do with my students and they struggle with bias. Um, I think it's particularly hard. I'm, I don't know how old you are, but I'm going to make a judgment that you're younger than me. And the, so the, the age group of the students that I teach, which are up to about 30 years old, grew up in a time where social media was the primary news source for them. And there is no clear line between editorial content and opinion and news coverage. When I grew up, all of the newspaper was news and there were just two pages in it that were opinion. So I was able to develop a really good sense of what is opinion and what is not. On TV, there's a newscast and then half an hour later, there is a current affairs program. So on the current affairs program, you get bias and um, editorialization. On the news program, you just get straight news reporting. So um, my ability to identify editorialization in my own work is just naturally a bit better developed just by dint of my age, not because I'm any better at a journalist or any smarter than my students. Um, so what I say to them is as a journalist, if somebody tells you it's raining and somebody tells you it's sunny, it is not your job to do a story that has the person who says it's raining and the person who says it's sunny. Your job is to stick your head out the window and see if it gets wet. If your head gets wet, you tell the audience it's raining and you interview the person who says it's raining. If your head stays dry, you tell the audience it's not raining and you interview the guy who says it's not raining. If you can't establish the truth of a story for yourself, for your own um, judgment, then you haven't finished your research. So when you make a choice about which character to focus your story on, you have to be confident that that character has a viewpoint that is truthful. And if they don't, then you need to include balance. But if you have established that with confidence for yourself, using your own moral framework, and your own ethical positions, then I think it's sufficient to choose one person to focus on. But it's Thank not you. easy. It's not. Thank you. Sorry, I think I have the mic and just, and uh, regarding the journalistic discipline, like uh, I'm just uh, very curious if, if there is an example that it's taught in the secondary school so that kids know the news, how to, it's usually kids are not protected mainly. I mean, it's good to have it from the childhood. So is there an example in the world that this discipline is taught in the secondary schools? Not that I know of, um, but I try and I make all my lessons like fun. Like I'm aware that I teach teenagers. 
So for example, um, there is a rumor in Australia at the moment, it's really funny, that 5G, you know, the 5G network will boil your eyeballs. That's going around social media. And I saw it from a friend of my husband, who's like 40. Um, and, and he shared it on social media. So it, it's like people believe it. They're really quite worried about this. So I get my students to do fake news bingo with 5G. So I show them this story that showed up on Facebook and it's, it's a great example. I'll send you a link. It's a great example of fake news at work. Um, it's a story that looks like a news site, but it's just like some rubbish site that has just been, you know, created two weeks ago. And in the story, they say research shows that 5G is, you know, harmful for blah, blah, blah. And they have a hyperlink. And if you click on the hyperlink, it goes to another site, which has a documentary about why 5G is dangerous to your health. And in that documentary, they say research shows blah, blah, blah. And they cite the website. So it's circular. So the people publishing this have create, have gone to quite like the documentary is 90 minutes long. It's like they've gone to a lot of effort to find people who will go on camera and say that 5G is going to, you know, give your child a third arm. Um, and the, um, but the, the pattern of news is circular. So students get that. They're really like, once they've seen one of those, they are so good at spotting fake news on Twitter. They follow every link. And if it's, and the other thing I teach them is if it says research says, and it takes you to a, a um, journal article that's been published, you know, um, by Taylor and Francis or Sage Pub or Google Scholar, um, you have to read the article. Cause a lot of times with fake news, it'll say research says, it'll send you to an article that is legitimate by a legitimate scientist. And the, the article actually says the opposite of what the journalist was claiming. So students understand those concepts from a really young age. I don't have any problems communicating that, but I think it's important that you make it fun for them. Thank you. Yeah. Um. What do you think, what are the tr last trends uh, in multimedia? I mean, you said that, uh, for example, loop sounds are old fashioned. Mm. Um, so uh, is multimedia changing or something new happened? Yeah, good question. Um, so I think initially multimedia stories were a lot longer than they are now. So the first multimedia story um, was Black Hawk Down. It was published by the Philadelphia Inquirer in 1997. And it turned, it was later released as a book. So that should give you an idea. It was like 80,000 words. Um, it was a 29 part series and it had little tiny snippets of video and audio as well with it. Um, and it was released over six months. So they would post a chapter every week or so. Um, and that was the style for a long time was that multimedia stories took hours to consume. Now, I think that Everest one that I showed you is a really good example of contemporary multimedia practice. It's a scroller, scrolly teller, we call them. <laughs> yep. So you scroll through the story. So it doesn't require a lot of complicated navigation. Um, so it's, it's very simple for the to use and it's, it's quite a short story too, and very heavy on visuals, but it's, it, they've also been quite disciplined. They haven't included a photo gallery with 25 images. They've just put six photographs in there and one video. So they're making, this goes back to what Richard Kochi Hernandez said, it's intentional. There's a lot of intent in the choices that they've made. And I think that um, is one of the trends. Um, I know about a researcher in Berkeley who is doing a multimedia story that is like a choose your own adventure news narrative. And it's, it's done using Alexa devices. So you ask Alexa a question and then the answer that you get is, you know, the, and then she asks you to make a choice and you make a choice and you navigate through the story that way. So I think as new technology like voice activated search devices come online, journalists will always jump on and try and use them straight away. 
And one trend that we see, um, you know, we, we started making online video before the audience wanted online video. And for five years, there was this huge debate about whether it was worth it. And then eventually the audience caught up and the internet speeds caught up. And now online video is popular everywhere. We started doing 360 before the audience wanted 360. And even now, 360 is hard to sell. Um, but uh, scholars that I have worked with think that when 360 can be viewed through your glasses, like through a headset that's as easy to wear as this, then people will have an appetite for 360. So I think that's one of the next big trends, but I think it's still three or four years away. Um, I think we're going to change the way we use audio in the news as well. I think sound design is going to start to become really important and stereo sound design particularly because still, you know, when I started at the Sydney Morning Herald, we had a video server that was a video player for our audience that could deliver video in stereo, but we had never made a stereo video. I'm not even talking surround sound, just stereo. Um, so, you know, I made the first stereo video that we did at Fairfax because I found out from the tech guys that we had the capability to do it. And then no one cared and no one watched it and stereo wasn't really, I mean, people watched it, but they didn't engage in it on, in the stereo format. But if you release that video today with everyone walking around with wireless headphones, I think you would get a much stronger uptake of it. So um, to answer your question, I think journalists will always be a little bit ahead of audience demand with technology, but we shouldn't shy away from the technology just because of that. Um, and I think what we have that's really great is a space to experiment and get it right um, before the audience really wants it. So we have a highly developed technical and creative form when they come to it. multimedia reporting journalism that you spoke about is so powerful because you've got the written word, you've got video, you've got audio. It is so compelling, the whole thing, and so real that how, if someone wants to fool you with fake news, it would be that much more difficult to look at all of those elements and to, and to take them apart to, to find out what was fake. So is there greater danger in multimedia reporting of actually using fake news to convince people and they are so compelled by it that they don't take the time to verify? Yeah, uh, that's a great question. And I think we're, what we're seeing, you probably all know more about the fake news that's coming out of Russia than I do. Um, but we have seen some amazing examples in the last two years in particular of very highly produced videos that clearly have as a team of technicians and artists working on them and their propaganda or fake news. Um, I think some technology will evolve to help us with the fake news scenario, fake news spotting, but I really think the, um, the only way forward is for the audience to have a higher degree of news literacy. So when they see something, I mean, when we see something that we agree with, that should be the first red flag for everybody. And I think in 10 years, our audience will have a much higher um, technical literacy than they do now. Um, the research at the moment says that the baby boomers are the most likely to share fake news on Facebook, and they're 10 times more likely than millennials. So um, we are actually developing that sense. And I think that sense is going to be the most important thing. Like we can have all the tools in the world, but you saw the video of Barack Obama. I mean, it's just, there's no, I could look at that for years and not see what's wrong with it. Um, so I think the technology is, is going to surpass us. But what I, I do know is that Barack Obama would never admit publicly to paying his workers $8 an hour in New York, right? That's the first line of dialogue in that video. Um, so that's, that's the sense that we have to um, evolve and develop in the audience to combat this. It's a bit bleak, sorry. Yeah, and then you, know, you have Fox News. You have Fox News on the one side and, and CNN now almost on the other end of the spectrum. And depending on who you're watching, the same event, the same incident, is covered entirely differently by these two networks. Yeah. So depending on your own bias and preference for who you want to believe, 
you may not be getting the true story. Absolutely, yeah. And I think, you know, the, the other problem that we have to address as a civilization is the, the way we conduct public debate. Um, if you and I live in a totally different moral universe and you just can't talk to me because you hate everything about my position, then we can't be part of the same effective democracy. Like, it can be a democracy, but it's not effective because the idea of democracy is that there has to be public debate about issues. And we come together to decide what's best for the most people. That's the concept, right? So if we can't come together in the first place, then the, the system of democracy is starting to rupture and break. Um, I, I don't know what the answer to that is except education. I, and I don't think it's a complete answer because you have a lot of highly educated people who are very partisan. Um, but I think it's, it's the first step anyway. Sorry, I can't. The entire United States Congress. Yeah. Oh, and Australia too. I mean, and many places around the world, you know, highly privileged, highly educated people who can't come together on anything. Yeah. It's, it's why we work in universities. We believe in education. <laughs> Okay, cool. I think we should wrap it up. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you.